live from the Hyatt Regency in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to a community of leadership, a community of engagement, a community of action. Welcome to the 2022 Hope Global Forum's annual meeting, Bridging the Divide. Please welcome Operation Hope's President of Operations, Mr. Lance Triggs. Woo-hoo! How's everybody doing? We need everybody to take a seat. We're about to get this show on the road. Is everybody doing okay? You ready for a great time over the next couple of days? No, nah, they don't sound like it. Sound like you're tired already. Are you ready to have a great time over the next couple of days at the Hope Global Forum? All right. Now, y'all know I have low self-esteem, so I kind of need, you know, some mmm up in here. All right. Well, if we can have those that are standing, please take your seats. I know we have some individuals that are uh, in line getting some of their food, and uh, when they're ready, they can join us. But for everyone sitting in the front area, if we could have everyone take your seat so we can get this show on the road. We have an exciting kickoff night for all of you. And, you know, isn't it good to be back in person together? Does it feel good? Give yourselves a round of applause. Absolutely. Now, before we get the show on the road, we have a number of sponsors that we need to thank because without them, there is none of this. We're not doing any of this. So it's very important to acknowledge, you know, those that are making it very possible uh, for us. Now, I think you may not know that this is Operation Hope's 30th anniversary, right? And I want to give an acknowledgement to Wells Fargo. Is Wells Fargo in the house? That's right. Wells Fargo has been our longtime sponsor of the Hope Global Forum for a number of years, and they are our signature sponsor for the 30th. So let's give them a round of applause. And we have another great partner, a great sponsor that is playing a big role in allowing us to provide this great event. It's Truist in the house. I know they're in the house. Woohoo! That's right, that's right. Allison Robinson and the team. Now Truist not only is one of our great partners and big sponsors for this uh, event, but they are our largest partner with the Hope Inside Network, soon to be 50 locations that is gonna serve over a thousand branches. Right? Right? So let's give Truist a round of applause. So happy for you being there. You got their A team here. That's what I'm talking about. And then we also have another great sponsor of ours who's been with us for a number of years, and that's Huntington Bank. And so Huntington Bank is a premier bank sponsor for us. And let's give them a round of applause. Because we work with uh, the learning management system through Huntington Bank. And because of that ability, the One Million Black Business Initiative is educating a number of black-owned businesses uh, with the use of our learning management system. So we have an incredible event uh, for all of you. And, you, you know, from the pitch competition, which we're very excited about, but there's so much more. And so we're going to be providing some scholarships and some grants tonight. I thought that Jerry McGuire, somebody said, show me the money. So we're going to be showing some people the money tonight, okay? All right. So everyone, let's have a seat. We're ready to get this show on the road. And let's get this party started. What do you think? And we have a video presentation for you. An individual's sense of belonging and trust is so important to address as we think about removing the barriers to financial inclusion. You can't grow a community or a country without access to banking. 
you need entrepreneurs and business and consumer health in concert with a solid banking system to uplift and grow any community. This long-standing complex issue is one that we knew that Wells Fargo would not be able to solve alone, and we couldn't think of a better partner than Operation Hope. Wells Fargo and Operation Hope have a 30-year relationship that's based on trust. I am super excited about this opportunity to extend their resources and expertise into the broader community. You needed a system for uplift, systemic uplift, and so we found hope inside of a bank branch. Operation Hope has a unique approach around economic empowerment and using financial coaching to help people overcome financial challenges and meet their financial goals and dreams. Hope Inside is an awesome opportunity for us to bring financial coaches and counselors into our branches and really help extend their reach into the community. We're literally going to help create a generation of sustainable new customers. We're sitting here in this beautifully redesigned branch that was designed with community needs in mind. And I can't wait to see many more of these branches come to life in low and moderate income communities, as well as see Hope Inside centers as we scale to 20 markets by the end of 2023. We can have a true impact on the community as we have more welcoming environments and we provide services that help community members understand that we are partners with them in their financial journey. At this time, we want to have a very special person from the Hope Army, one of our Hope Financial Coaches. I want you to know that through our financial coaches, Everything happens. So we have someone special that's going to join us to talk about her testimonial. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Michelle Pillow, one of our Wells Fargo Hope Inside coaches. I see you, Wells Fargo, over there in Stone Mountain. Oh, make it happen. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Pillow, and I have the distinct honor of being Hope Inside's 200 coach inside of our 200 location, Wells Fargo, in Stone Mountain, Georgia. We, <laughs> we celebrated our grand opening on October the 19th of 2022. And that is so special to me because to be really honest with you, it was just a few days before that grand opening that I realized that this was not an accident. You see, my journey started 12 years ago when I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, actually to Stone Mountain, Georgia from Chicago, Illinois. I um, was in a marriage, gone bad, I mean really bad. <laughs> um, and I knew I was going to leave, but I had planned to leave like a year before I actually left. I had worked on my degree two years prior to coming here, thought I'd get another degree, and then I was gonna go. However, Situations happened and it became necessary for me to leave right away. And I told my daughter, we have to go and we gotta go now. So we left, I had two kids in college, 14 year old daughter in high school, and I sold all the furniture that we had in the house. I don't know what he said when he came home, there was no furniture. And I think somebody gave me like $600 with $3,000 worth of furniture. I packed everything else that we could in our car and we drove to Stone Mountain, Georgia, where my mother lived in a one bedroom ant infested apartment. I mean, literally, you would wake up in the morning and the wall would be covered with ants. Now, the reason that's so significant because it was actually maybe three minutes from the Wells Fargo that I work in right now. So I moved here, I was divorced, I had no job, I was financially challenged. Shortly after I got here, my car was repossessed. I had to tell my two boys who were in college, y'all gonna have to make it, you're gonna have to man up and do whatever it is that you need to do because I gotta take care of myself and your sister. Um, so what I did was, I'm so thankful today for financial literacy because I was in that neighborhood, I actually got a job, I think, working customer service at home or something like that. They came on the phone one day and told me, we lost contract, the job is ending. I said, well, how much time? We got two weeks. Michelle Pillow, when we hang up this phone, you done. It's over. So 
You know, I spent some time, you know, we all, we go into low and moderate income neighborhoods to work. Like I said, where I was living was maybe three minutes from the bank that I work in now teaching financial literacy. So I remember stepping outside and I didn't go out that much because we were in the hood and the girls in the hood said, why you out here? Because <laughs> they thought I was bougie. <laughs> And I'm like, well, I'm just hanging out. They said, no, you out here for a reason. So I kind of explained my situation. And they had some solutions, none of which I was very interested in. <laughs> but, they, but they had some. One was stripping. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for the information. <laughs> That's the only job information you have? It was. No, they had some other interesting things, none of which I wanted to do. So one of the girls said, look, I'm going to take you down to some office, they're going to give you some money and some food stamps. When those people told me that they were going to give me $250 for me and a kid, I'm like, how are we supposed to live off of $250 a month? And then you want me to come work for it too? So I decided not to do that either. I mean, I, at least I had a hairdresser's license. I could, do, I could talk to somebody and let me get them a perm, you know, or something. <laughs> And I was like, four perms a month, you know, or something like that. But um, I didn't take any of their solutions, but there was a lady at my church who invited me to a financial literacy class. And this is why I know the power of financial literacy. You know how the Bible says, God said he, he was going to give them the power to get well. But my power came from the financial literacy class that I took. Now, I had to tell you how bad it was to help you understand how good it is now. Because... I did eventually, to be honest with you, when I lived in that neighborhood and in my mother's apartment, my plan was to get out and never come back. <laughs> I had no intentions. Now people are like, you gonna move a little closer? No, <laughs> you know, maybe a little, but not too close. But I will tell you this, I took this financial literacy class. Um, my car had gotten repossessed. I was at the buy here pay a heck of a lot here place. You know, they say buy here, pay now, pay here. No, it's buy here, pay a whole lot here. 24, 26% interest. I have been there. And um, the financial literacy class, when I got there and the lady began to teach me about money and about credit, I think I had six credit cards. And I really didn't know how to manage them. In fact, she asked me to tear them up and I told her I was not tearing up one credit card. I need these cards. But when she talked me into calling the credit card companies and asking them how much interest I was paying on each one of them credit cards, I'm like, 28%? Are you serious? 26%, you know? And I like buy now, pay later, and I like buy now, pay never even better. I wasn't paying them, so I don't know why I was, you know? <laughs> I don't know why I was upset about the interest rate, but I was. But in any event, it is so much better now. I was recently approved for a mortgage with Wells Fargo. Thank you, Wells Fargo. My credit score is in the 700s, and I teach people every day not only how to raise their credit score, but how to maintain. When you get to a certain level, you can get there, but can you stay there? And that's one of the most important things. So I would like to thank Operation Hope and Wells Fargo for the opportunity that I have every day to go in and help people who are or may be where I once was. Thank you. Have a great evening. How you like that? That's what it's all about, right? Making change. We're very excited. Thank you, Wells Fargo. And Michelle is doing a great job as one of our Hope Inside coaches uh, there in Stone Mountain. So ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to welcome uh, from Wells Fargo, their head of diverse segments and representation and inclusion, Ms. Christy Furco. Come on out, Christy. Give her a round of applause. And the man and the reason for why we're here for 30 years, it's his vision at Operation Oak, founder, chairman, and CEO, uh -oh, I'm in trouble, CEO, John Hope Bryant. <laughs> Hello, Atlanta! Come on now. The Bible suggests be hot or be cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spat you out. 
Translation, even God does not like mediocrity. Come on now, act like you're meeting your wife or your husband for the first time or <laughs> your new employer. <laughs> Somebody giving you a loan for your first time. Hello, Atlanta. You're in the ballroom. You're in the ballroom. The Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Andrew Young, who will be with us tomorrow, he was just with us early tonight, held their last planning staff meeting in before he went off for the Poor People's Campaign and unfortunately in 68 was assassinated. You are in the same ballroom. Wow. Everything we do in the next two days is intentional. Three days. It's intentional. It's about you. Now, I have a little bit of a problem. When Christy was introduced, she walked out and you like, <laughs> let me explain something to you. Let me break this down. Wells Fargo Bank has almost $2 trillion in assets. In 170 years, she's the first black female ever to report to the CEO on the executive management team. <laughs> she's the first black female CEO of a money center bank's mortgage company in the history of America. <laughs> She's the first black to be chair, female to be CEO and chairman, sorry, chairman of the Mortgage Bankers Association. <laughs> and they just gave her another job at Wells Fargo, which I don't understand, <laughs> which has this complicated title, head of diverse segment, basically head of black and brown folk stuff. <laughs> and because of her and other work, you got also other sheroes in the audience from Wells Fargo. Darlene Goins is here somewhere from Wells Fargo. Another, stand up, Darlene. Stand up. The Black Inclusion Initiative. You've got change in America, and it's sitting right here. Like we're in church. <laughs> we go, oh no, we're gonna have some church. It is Sunday. We can say amen. It's amen. <laughs> I don't want you to be casual about this. The next movement is about opportunity. First Reconstruction, freedoms, 1800. Second Reconstruction, access, 1960s. Third Reconstruction, opportunity, 2020, 2030. You're living in a moment in history and you're meeting history makers. From the civil rights in the streets to civil rights in the suites. So let's have a conversation. Let's do. I'm not going to be easy on you. Okay. Because Wells Fargo's got a complicated history. Indeed. We're turning a corner, rainbows after storms. You're part of that. And I commend Charlie and Bill and all for the changes they made. And to pick you was an interesting uh, selection because they could have gone safe. Well, you are what I call a real sister, S-I-S-T-A. <laughs> tell us about mom and dad. Tell us about you, the yeah. real story. Well, so I'd like to tell people I am the daughter of a track coach and a stay-at-home mom. Uh, my father has the distinction of being the first black head coach to lead a Division I major university. He was the track coach at the University of Arizona. Um, and so, yeah, we can give it up for dad. Uh, so my father was named, uh, so I was born in Compton, California. Um, yeah, straight out of Compton. So uh, my whole family, both sides, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, everyone's in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, and so went from 99.9% .9 black in Compton to Tucson, Arizona, which was 99.9% .9 white. So my upbringing was traversing both worlds. So I wasn't, you know, after, like when I, we'd go back to Compton, they'd be like, well, why do you talk funny? And it was like, what do you mean how I talk funny? And so, you know, after a couple of days of being there, I'd pick up my South Central slang and my mother would be like, don't you change for anyone. 
you be who you are. And so grew up never being black enough for the black kids or white enough for the white kids. So I just learned to be authentically me. And however that kind of showed up and was. Now, my mother's here, Juanita Smith, Hi. sitting right here, whose credit score is 857, by the way. <laughs> my mother says she's not black, she's green. <laughs> I want to once ask Christy, my mother, if she's going to get married again. She divorced my dad over money. She said, yeah, baby, if I get married again, he's going to be a BMW. I said, mom, don't be vain. She said, no, 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 baby, a black man working. <laughs> mom was a bad sister. But mom and I remember a different Compton. Like, mm. clearly you, went to, you grew up in the bougie Compton. Like, there was a... There was a, there was a, there was a hardcore, there was a stucco Compton. <laughs> there was no bougie Compton where we were. You're not in a bougie Compton? No. Okay. 126 in El Segundo. Oh no, that's hardcore. Yeah, okay. that's not bougie. So where did you get your self-esteem from? Where did you get that confidence from? And how does that inform, how does that in the way you grew up and what you saw, the two worlds you lived in, how does that inform how you live and lead today, or do you leave her at the door? Do you leave Christy at the door and come up with a new, what, talk to us? I don't, yeah, and I actually, when I see people do that, I actually tell them to stop. Mm. Uh, I think to, if you try to be somebody at work and somebody at home, you're not gonna be good, your authentic self either way. And so for me, it's always about show up true to who you are because that incongruence and I know we you know we talk about in corporate America the black tax like we got to act a certain way or say a certain thing and I've never found that worked for me because I couldn't remember <laughs> I couldn't remember who I was supposed to be when I was supposed to be so I just showed up to be who I was and I think that's really important my confidence came from my parents I mean they told us and raised us. I tell people, my, my parents didn't raise kids, they coached us. Mm. And my parents said, you could be anything that you wanted to be if you put your mind to it and you strived hard. My dad used to always say, what the mind can perceive, the will can achieve. And so we grew up just believing that there were no limits. And my parents, I have zero memories growing up of my parents actually telling me no. Everything was about consequences. All right, you want to do that? then here's what the consequences of that are. But if you do this, here are the consequences. And we always got to choose. So they were always teaching us critical thinking, making our choices, living with the consequences of your choices. That's um, deep. And so that helped, that just helped grow, grow my esteem to just be who I was. So no no no's, just if no, you no. do it, here are the consequences of your actions. Yeah. That's powerful. And we got beat now. <laughs> <laughs> Those consequences were severe, but you just, you know, you got to do what you wanted to do. Well, we call it spanking. We yeah. call it, wasn't No, it? we got beat. <laughs> it was corporal punishment. I, I didn't get spanked. Mom, you were kind on him. I didn't get spanked. We got beat if we didn't do things right. Yeah, you tell my, my mom would tell you to go back and get a, a, twi a, a, a switch from the backyard. Oh, yeah. And you came back with a little twig, she'd go get half the treat. Yeah. My mom used Hot Wheel tracks. You guys remember those Hot Wheel tracks? Yeah, mama used Hot Wheel tracks for us. Oh yeah, no, I was more concerned about the gangs. <laughs> Sorry, I was more concerned about my mother than the gangs around the corner. I, I feared my mother more. And that, that, my mother told me she loved me every day of my life. Clearly, that's what you had. And that there's nothing more powerful than a child being told they are loved. You start taking no for vitamins. Yeah. So let's now transition. We're gonna try and cover a lot of content in a short period of time. Let's transition now. To, to the version of you that's sitting in front of us, who's, ha who's, who's helping to lead one of the biggest companies in the world, one of the top two or three money center banks, I think arguably in the world, dealing with something that affects all of us, which is mortgages, home ownership, but also brand. We just opened our 200th location with you, proud of that. Charlie came out honored by that, good guy. And he's helping to pivot. But talk to us about the pivot from what? Where are we are right now and where are we going with you? Yeah. So I'll start with the story of when I joined Wells Fargo. So I was with Flagstar Bank and uh, George Floyd had actually just been murdered. And I think like many people I was contemplating, like that just hit me, like rocked me to my core. And we had those series of deaths leading up to George Floyd. And, 
Um, that one just rocked me to my core because we watched a man take his last breath on the streets of the United States of America. And it seemed like nobody cared. And then we saw what happened. A lot of people cared. But for me, that was a really hard week. And I remember just thinking all week, like, what am I supposed to do? Like, how, how do I process this? What do I do with this? And, you know, I was feeling I, I've had a life of this unbelievable opportunity and privilege, yet I'm a part of a community and race that, like, you can step outside and, and be killed um, for just being who you are. And I was struggling back and forth, and I remember just thinking and praying to God, like, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? And I kept hearing housing, you're where you need to be, housing, you're where you need to be. But at the same time, how many of you, Pastor Mike uh, Jr. had that song, Big? And every time I turned around, I'd be praying, and then I'd finish, I'd be in the closet, I'd come out, and Big was on the radio. I'd go for a run, I'd come out, and Big was on the radio. I just kept saying, what's up with Big, what's up with Big? And literally a week to the day of George Floyd's murder, I got the call about the Wells Fargo job. And I was like, okay, Lord, I guess that's big. If, you know, I want to put more blacks in homes, home ownership is still the single largest financial purchase many people will ever make. It is still the best pathway that we have to wealth and generational wealth. And I was leading a mortgage company then, and Wells Fargo is the largest bank mortgage company in the country. And so... During my interview, I interviewed with Charlie, and I interviewed with others. Charlie's the CEO of Wells Fargo. The CEO, yeah. And when they said, why do you want this job? I said, I want to put more black people in homes. And I was thrilled that their answer, every person, yeah. Well, and I was thrilled, thank you. But I was thrilled that every person's answer was, great, come do that here. And so that told me that was a different Wells Fargo. And, um, you know, I came in and... You know, I was pretty bold with it. I was like, where's my money? Where's my team? What's the numbers look like? How do we start to drive this? Where's the plan? Where are the products? And I've gotten support every step of the way. And, you know, the special purpose credit program. I mean, when HUD came out and clarified the rulemaking that you can do um, lending on the basis of race through special purpose credit programs, we were one of the first lenders in the market with it. And Charlie gave me $150 million. Yeah, let's give it up for that. But what we did is we looked at our portfolio, and we saw the blacks in our portfolio that had not refinanced over the last two years, the lowest refinance market in the history, right? Lowest interest rate market in history. And we had a significant number of blacks in our portfolio, over 60,000 that had not taken advantage of the refinance. Wow. And they were sitting at six and 7% interest rates. And so Charlie gave me $150 million and we said, we're gonna buy down people's interest rate to 3.75% and we're still in the market with it. We actually just rolled out our GSE product last Tuesday. Interest rates are at 7%. We're still buying down interest rates to 3.75% to get people to refinance their mortgages. <laughs> so that's, that's real money, real commitment, doing work for our community. So we, we only have about a minute left. We could do this one session all night because 41% of all blacks own a home. I want that to sink in with you for a minute. 70% plus of whites own a home, 75%. Every group does better than us. The number one way if you don't remember anything tonight, remember this. Go home and tell everybody you know, the number one way to build wealth in America is home ownership. ownership. Yes. My grandmother on my mother's side was a slave. My mother owned a shotgun, my grand, sorry, my great grandmother. My mother, grandmother owned a shotgun shack. My mother owned seven homes. I own 700. That's not an accident, that's role modeling. Yes. Uh, same thing happened on my father's side. Grandfather was a sharecropper. Dad owned a business. I'm an entrepreneur. It's role modeling. Success is a habit. So you are breaking some bad habits in the past in banking and also Wells Fargo, again, made some mistakes. They've owned it. Mm -hmm. And now we see the bank pivoting in a powerful new direction. 
I think ben, uh, Dr. Chavis is in the audience, a civil rights leader in the 60s. He would never think that a bank would give access to credit, yet alone have somebody making credit decisions. He, he, he'd have to protest. He'd have to scream and holler. Now, I think what I'm hearing you saying, and, and I wanted you to take it here and give us, give, give us a vision for the future and tell black women your opinion of how best to win. We, we, we used to think that revolution was the only way. What I'm hearing you say, come inside and let evolution be another way, right or wrong. Yes, but I hesitated because I do think it's both. I think some of the revolution is we can't play safe. We can't do it our own. We can't do it the way. We can't play the game the way they played the game. I think part of the reason of my success is I don't play by their rules. I write my own rules, and I have enough confidence to say that if it doesn't work for Wells Fargo, I can go somewhere else and do this. And I think they know that. And that's the power that we have. Like, we need to take back our power to say, if you don't want what I have to offer, there's another company, there's another bank down the street. Because the reality, the reality of this market is our communities, the Hispanic communities, this is the browning of America for real. Like the, major, the minority is going to be the majority. And so they need to understand how to speak to our communities. They need to understand how to market to our communities, what products with our communities. And so we have power and a voice like we never have before. And I think it's the opportunity to lean into that and to be bold about that. If we look, if we are in that room and I'm the only black woman in the room, and if I act like them, then I've missed the opportunity to tell them what makes our brand different. And so that's the opportunity that we have, is when you're in the room, show up authentically who you are. Bring a different voice. Bring something different, and they'll listen to that, because it's, it is all about the green. Yeah. And if I have the best idea about how to advance additional business for Wells Fargo, that's an idea that they'll listen to. It doesn't matter that it's coming from a black woman. So I think that's the opportunity that we all have, is when you're in the room, be intentional and make your voice count, and don't play it safe. That's the little revolution piece I think we still need to do. And I'm convinced that Charlie Sharp is smart enough, and Bill Daly are smart enough to, 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 to make an attractive offer to you to keep you there, which they have, but also to give you the environment where you can thrive. So I believe you'll be there for a long time. I believe it actually is a good company trying to do the right thing. I think you made the right choice. And I think this is the new movement. Like what you do will last for generations, for yeah. generations. Yeah, that's the impact that we're trying to have. This isn't about just, I mean, I want to put more people in homes, but this is about having lasting changes, not only for individuals, for families, but for communities and impacting the generation. And to make this real for you, Opry Shop is moving credit scores 50 to 100 points in six months to, to, to 18 months, debt down $2,600, savings up $400 to $1,000, uh, making you bankable, and they've just ordered 120 Hope Inside locations nationwide. Ladies and gentlemen, please say thank you to Chris. Thank you, guys. Thank you, my friends.